lovely to be with my spiritual home here. And so I have a question for you. Is the life you are living the life that wants to live in you? So think about that for a minute. And I want to see just a show of hands. Without, and I want you to think about it with your heart, not too much of your head. So let me see who would say that the life there is living is the life that wants to live in you. Who would say that? I knew we'd get a lot of people in here. Yes, because of the spiritual work that we've done. Well, today's topic I, I decided on because this guy called Parker Palmer, and I highly recommend this book, it's called Let Your Life Speak. And he actually has worked in higher education. He also wrote a book called The Courage to Teach. And He's actually, the, let your life speak comes from an old Quaker saying, he actually is a Quaker. Let your life speak means live your life from your highest values and ideals and do everything according to that. And when I think about my life, how I did that change throughout my life. And I'm actually going to share to you, with you today a lot of my own personal journey because I think that's where the details are found. And I'm hoping that as I share my journey, you'll reflect on yours and be awakened to this spiritual consciousness and the journey that he calls Let Your Life Speak. And the subtitle of it is called Listening to the Voice of Vocation. And a lot of us call vocation as a job. And in fact, a job is something you do on the, the outside and it comes into you, but no, no, no. Vocation actually comes from the Greek word meaning a voice. Vocation, a voice, it's a calling. And so I don't believe in the word retirement because retirement is something that we finish because it's a job, but when you focus on a vocation, what we're doing throughout our life is transforming and reinventing ourselves. Who, who knows that? Who's in that process right now? Yes, yes. So I understand retirement because there's certain things and my own husband had to retire from GE because it was a job that he needed to finish so that he could move into himself a little more and his, his job was done there. But the work that I do, it's like I can't not do it. And when you know you can't not do it, you know that you are doing your calling. And I'm going to journey through my own process to get to this place. And I have to read this to you. It's absolutely beautiful about vocation. There's a word to think about. Our deepest calling is to grow into our own authentic selfhood, which John touched on today, having that divine light come in and be expressed through our own personal gifts and talents. Whether or not it conforms to some image of who we ought to be. And as we do so, we will not only find the joy that every human being seeks, we will also find our path of authentic service in the world. And as I was reflecting on this, I was, is Mary in here, Mary, Mary Vavrik, I'm not sure if she is. Mary came to mind as I was preparing for today, and she was the one that set up the uh, Red Cross blood bank outside, and she, which is a, a feat in of itself, to get a mobile blood bank to be here, and then arranged all of us in schedule to go and have our blood drawn and to be of service in the world. And that was Mary's calling, and she did it with such grace and beauty as we know she does in all of her service. That's a vocation. That is a calling, and she does it from her heart and actually I posted on Facebook about giving blood and I had people that are not necessarily parts of our church but said thank you I need platelets and you're the reason why I can get my platelets which are part of the blood that they extract for people that uh, can't clot properly they need platelets so they don't bleed out all the time and that's what I mean by vocation doesn't it be big fancy big thing we do in our life, it's, it's what our calling is. And I often refer to this particular quote that Parker Palmer uses here, as I've journeyed through my place of what I'm actually doing in the world now, of true vocation joins self with service. And it is when your true gladness meets a deep need in the world. 
Vocation is where your deep gladness meets a deep need in the world. So if you're doing something in a job that's not bringing you joy, it's not doing you service and it's not doing the world a service. But it's a path, isn't it? You don't just, doesn't just happen. It, it's a journey. And boy, it would have been really nice to be able to get to this place in my 20s. <laughs> and maybe that's possible because I'm seeing a lot of young people that are, that are really trusting their authentic self much more. I was just at a conference in Florida. And I have never seen so many young women that are listening to their calling more than I certainly listened to it in my 20s. So I decided that I'm, and I highly recommend this little short book, but it's, Parker Palmer is a great writer. And then as I was kind of reflecting on what my journey I'm going to share today, I popped this off my shelf with Michael Beckwith called Like Life Visioning. We know Michael, he started the Agape Church. And this is an actual process, which by the way, I think would be a great book study here for one of our after Sunday, four consecutive uh, Sundays, because it's a process, a transformative process for activating your unique gifts and your highest potential. And he goes through each step of the way. And I'm going to use Michael's stages. These are his stages that he talks about us going through, which aligns so beautifully with this idea that Parker Palmer talks about of letting your life speak. And here is a little summary of my journey in four sentences from Parker Palmer. I just love his work. It's a vision of vocation. Now I become myself. It's taken time, many years and many places. I've been dissolved and shaken. Many of us have gone through dark nights. I have to awaken through those to something new. And it seems like embracing the shadow as well as the light is part of this process. And having a community like this to support that process, to know that we can get through that. I've, it's, I've been dissolved and shaken, worn other people's faces. Thought we had to be someone else. In those four sentences, it's a poem by May Sarton. That's the journey that I'm going to talk about. So, the stage one journey for me was when I was a competitive swimmer, and you heard that I was uh, a competitive swimmer for Australia, because everybody in Australia swims. <laughs> but competitively, like the Michael Phelps kind of competition. It was hard work, there's no gain without pain, I was used to pushing, driving, and then what did I do? I went to medical school. <laughs> Same thing, pushing, driving. And as I reflect on that time, I was driven in stage one by all these external forces. In fact, I got into medical school because in Australia back then, you were given medical school. If you get a certain mark in year 12, they offer you medical school, vet school, like everything. And it's free. Back then, it was free. So what am I going to do? Pass up medical school? So I said, oh yeah, I'll go to medical school. There was nothing internal in me calling me to that. It was, came from the outside, came inside me. So it was like life was happening to me sometimes called victim consciousness, but I don't like those terms. It's more allowing external factors, the need for approval, the need to help my parents. Like, didn't they like me to go to medical school? Like, always doing things because of outside factors, not driven by the inside. And medical school is really hard for me, and that was one of my dark nights of the soul, for sure. Um, and a lot of, you don't hear much about this, but suicide rates among medical students are very high. And I, the first time I actually knew this was not the thing for me was when I was a resident at uh, Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, and I was doing an uh, oncology term, cancer term, so there's a ward, and I was on the rounds. It's amazing how you remember these things. This is a long time ago, 1980s. I was doing rounds, I was a resident, I had medical students behind me, it was a teaching hospital. And uh, we had done some surgeries the day before, and we were going around talking to the patients post-op. 
and this surgeon, I don't even remember his name now and I'm glad that I don't, but he, uh, we walked into this room and I don't remember the lady's name, but it was like I picture her in the room, she's sitting in the bed, she's surrounded by family, she must have been quite young because she had young children there. And the oncologist walks in, and you've probably seen this, where the, the surgeon walks in, then the resident, then the charge nurse on the floor who's taking notes of what the protocol is, and then all the medical students. There's a lot of us in that room. And he literally walks up to this lady and says, yes, we did surgery yesterday. It wasn't what we expected. I opened you up. You were full of cancer. So I had to close you and there's nothing we can do. Yeah. Honest, that's exactly the words he said. Then he turned around and he left the room. Now, this is a hierarchy system, just like you see on ER and all these doctor shows. So I had to leave the room too, and so did the medical students. And my heart just hurt. And I realized at that moment, this is not okay. This is not what I came into medicine for. And so we had finished the rounds, and you want to know that when the rounds were over, I went back into that room. And I stood there with that family. There's nothing I could do. I couldn't fix what the issue was, but I could be there to bear witness and to hold the space and to practice loving kindness as part of the medical team that was delivering this news. And so at that point I knew I had to do something else. And wouldn't you know that at the end of that year I actually got married. So um, it, it was a marriage that was very short and I actually got married in the hospital chapel because my church was medicine at that time. I didn't have any spiritual, I didn't have any practicing spirituality like we do here. I mean, I certainly was spiritual, but I didn't have any concrete way of understanding that. So I, we chose the chapel at the, at the, at the hospital. That only really lasted about four years because I wasn't developed yet. I didn't know what I wanted and I left that marriage and it was a very, very difficult time. So then I said, okay, I've got to do something here. And so then I kind of moved into stage two, which is being a manifester for your life. Okay, so I want to do psychology. So that's when I started my master's degree in psychology. And in Anaheim, there was a conference of the American Psychological Association where Viktor Frankl was the keynote speaker. That was 1990. It must have been one of his last conferences. And Viktor Frankl wrote that book, Man's Search for Meaning, Holocaust survivor, where he was tortured and saw terrible things, but said, no one can take the spirit inside of me. And then he went on to become a psychiatrist. Uh, so I came to Anaheim, like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to practice affirmations. That's when you kind of start to bring in some spiritual practices that help you channel something bigger than yourself in this phase. And of course, Michael says, has a whole book about each phase, and it's beautiful how he talks through each of these phases. And wouldn't you have it, that wasn't actually the conference that changed my life at that point, but the people that I was staying with in Anaheim went to the church, the Science of Mind Church in Huntington Beach. <laughs> and I never knew there was such a thing as Science of Mind, but as they talked about what they believed in, I said, oh, that's what I believe in. So they took me to their church in Huntington Beach, and that's where I met Steve. <laughs> many of you know and love and who we've been married for 28 years now but of course we didn't get married right then okay that, I'm just telling you this like the, the good part the ending of the story so uh, but what happened was love and we talk about it all the time it opens love is a, a heart muscle energy that opens us up for a new possibility in fact I did come back to Australia because I had a job in Australia and a family and he followed me although he wouldn't tell you that that was how it went but he came and followed me and so then we dated and we fell in love and then I had a decision to make hmm. so he lives in Mission Viejo I live in Sydney he has two small little kids can't move so what am I going to do? So that's when I feel like I moved to this stage three. Through me is the stage in our life where we surrender, control, like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. I surrender. So I left my country, my career, my family for man. No, no, no. I left all of that for a vision. 
and didn't kind of know what I was on do, what, what I was doing but you don't on the spiritual level you don't the mind doesn't have a concrete understanding always it's a it's a calling it's a moving and I remember that feeling yeah that's what I meant to do and of course people in Australia would say you're crazy you've, you've got a job you're a doctor here in Australia and you you've got a family here it's like ah, I was so clear and you know to this day I've never regretted a second of it never it was it's truly a it was it came from the inside out and that is when you're starting to move from the inside out in your life and and then I went and looked at the medical system here and it's like okay no I <laughs> I that would be like moving backwards right oh let me be a doctor again now thank goodness there are amazing doctors on this planet and that's their calling it just wasn't mine to practice clinical medicine what I wanted to do was teach people how to be well so then I as a speaker and a coach and I teach health professionals to have businesses that are successful so that we can change the healthcare system to be more balanced to a wellness model that's clear about what I'm meant to do and then what happens is when you are like on you know that feeling when yes this is it this is it I'm flowing through I'm flowing through then as me is when I was saying to you that what I'm doing now I can't not do it's my authentic soul expression of myself I call it the Rosa Parks effect you know Rosa Parks it's December 1955 when this seamstress in Montgomery Alabama decided to sit in the front of a bus african-american woman sit in a seat designated for white people when you make can you believe that's not that long ago 1955 that that was so she sat in the front of the bus and legend has it that a graduate student asked her why did you sit at the front of the bus and she said i was tired <laughs> but we know it wasn't her feet that were tired her heart was tired her soul was tired her whole being was tired of the racism that was dictating her life and she took a stand for her soul's expression that authentic expression of her selfhood it was bold it was dangerous it was provocative and it was about sitting in the front of the bus what does it take for us to sit at the front of the bus in our life it takes courage it takes a lot of courage and I know that when we come to this center I'll speak for myself being a member of this church for 20 years coming here sitting in these chairs allows me to connect at the top and to be seen exactly as I am I don't have to pretend to be anyone else I've lived my life that stage one pretending to be something else and it's not pretty and being a doctor I'm here to tell you that it can create dis-ease in your body so being here and going to the classes listening to Sandy connecting with a community that is just full of love that opens their hearts to each other in non-judgment what I call loving kindness is so healing at this conference I'll tell you real quick there was a keynote speaker a psychiatrist she wrote a book actually called the rabbit effect and of course I love it when I see medical doctors that are coloring outside the lines it's called the rabbit effect and uh, she'd studied the hidden determinants of health and why she called the rabbit effect was they did these rabbit studies and they actually found that the rabbits that were held and stroked and given loving kindness had completely different outcomes in the experiments than the rabbits that were just put in the cages so as a psychiatrist she says well I wonder what this means for health and she so wrote a whole book with research documented on the hidden determinants of health and you know that's the kind of stuff that I love and I love to share so that we do realize that the health is mind body and spirit so in closing today because of course I've got to be so careful with my time <laughs> um, I want to do a little I give you a little gift 
as well as our spiritual practices here, of course we have our beautiful music and there's ways that we can activate our divine gifts through music. And in sign language, the sign for courage is the same as the sign for brave, which is actually the same as music. So this song is from a friend of mine called Janice Stanfield, you may know of her, uh, from her album Brave Faith. You don't have to feel brave so we that again. to be brave. You don't have to feel brave to be brave I don't have to feel strong to be strong We don't have to feel inspiring to inspire Remember when your road is rough and long Even a small star shines in the darkness For someone somewhere to see That's what your courage means to me Maybe there are times you feel lonely Like no one sees the world is made uniquely and no one ever sees their own magnitude even a small star shines in the darkness for someone somewhere to see That's what your courage means to me So don't be afraid to be a little brilliant Don't be afraid to shine in someone's eyes If we can trust the gifts that sometimes make us different Then we can all learn to shine, shine, shine Even a small star shines in the darkness For someone somewhere to see What your courage means to me It lights the way for those in the distance That's what your courage